Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. The Classical Education Podcast is proud to announce our consulting team. Beautiful Teaching is a classical education team consisting of master teachers and field experts. We specialize in professional development for schools, customized consulting, online immersion courses, seminar-led book studies, and comprehensive support for K-12 educators. Collectively, we have experts in the liberal, liberal arts for both classical homeschooling and classroom instruction. Our experiences range in many classical school models from classical charters to private Christian to home educators. If you are interested in connecting with someone to help your school, please visit classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash consulting. We're proud to announce the launch of our new online courses offering practical and immersion-based sessions. The newest immersive courses include K-12 mimetic instruction sessions that include lessons with live Q&A on mimetic lesson planning. In addition, we have sessions on teaching disputation, well-ordered thinking in a disordered world, this course is for 6th through 12th grade teachers to immerse them in an experience to help guide students towards well-ordered thinking in their writing and discussion. Our online book seminar sessions are also growing. Trey is offering a six-week course on Caldecott's Beauty in the Word. In this course, he will survey historical developments in education, re-examine the classical trivium through the light of the Christian imagination, and see how to give students an education in reality. There are a few more amazing book seminars and immersion courses coming soon. For up-to-date lists and courses, you can visit us at beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. That's beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. Or you can simply visit us at classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash courses. As always, you can also email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to the show. Today, I am joined by Kiernan Fiore, and Kiernan is one of our consultants on our team at Beautiful Teaching, and Kiernan specializes in K-12 through leadership for Title I classical charter schools, as well as Catholic education, curriculum maps, philosophy of education, and virtue-based lesson planning. And I would love to hear more about all of that uh, as our conversation conversation goes on. Today, we, we really want to focus on the difference between classical education and what has been termed neoclassical education. And so we wanted to bring Kiernan on as someone who could speak directly to that. And I think this, I think this conversation is going to be helpful to a lot of people. So Kiernan, welcome to the program. Thank you, Trey. I wonder if by means of introduction and letting people know a little bit more about who you are, could you just kind of tell us uh, your your background a little bit. Tell us your story as far as how you got involved with classical education and what, uh, other than working as a consultant with Beautiful Teaching, what else keeps you busy today? Oh, well, um, it, you ask how I got into classical education, and in some ways it found me. Um, so I was homeschooled, K-12, um, and my mom found classical education uh, around when I was in sixth grade. And the reason why I dated to sixth grade is I remember her purchasing Latin curriculum for me that year. Uh, I also remember starting logic that year. Um, so I, I can kind of identify that's when some of these classical subjects started to enter our life. Um, I remember Searcy Institute beginning to be discussed, just different um, and now uh, organizations that have a lot of curriculum and things like that. But it's kind of fun for me to think back to my childhood and remember when it was uh, really just a lot of ideas being bounced around. And um, I, I 
loved my education. I loved being homeschooled. Um, I, I, when I look back, and I think many people cannot say this, when I look back on my high school years, they're just golden years of reading. Um, now, something else that was really important in those years for me was um, Charlotte Mason. So uh, my mom read the original homeschooling series when I was in kindergarten or first grade. I called them the pink homeschool books. Um, and uh, I, remember, I remember her reading those. I remember her doing narration and copy work and things like that. So while we were doing some of these classical subjects, we also were using Amplified Online um, in its kind of initial stages and things like that. Um, so I absolutely loved my education and I was very adamant I was not going to be a teacher. I thought this is fantastic. I've been in a great education. I'm going to grow up and I'm going to do something different. Now I ought to have known that education was coming for me because I used to, one of my favorite pastimes was to get kind of homeschool curriculum and homeschool catalogs and plan out, imagine different families. If I had six kids, um, that were these ages, boys and girls, what would I have them study? How old were you when you were doing this sort of thing? Oh, like 14. <laughs> wow. So I should have known that education was in my future, but, you know, um, uh, the follies of youth, I suppose. So I went to Hillsdale College and I got a bachelor's degree in English. Absolutely loved that experience. And again, was absolutely insistent that I still didn't want to be a teacher. Um, and uh, I, I moved back to Ohio after I graduated. And I, I was working for um, an IT company and working in an office for the first time in my life. And I thought, oh, wow, I, I, I do not love this. So I started applying to just a, a, a broad swath of schools, and um, I got a job at Ambleside School of Colorado, um, which was in its initial years. Now, this was a Charlotte Mason school, not a, a classical, um, so to speak. And uh, usually these two types of schools see themselves as being somewhat different. Um, again, for me, that wasn't necessarily the case because of my own life experience. Um, and so that's where I had my first year teaching. Um, and as it is for everyone, it was a trial by fire and I loved every minute of it. Um, but I still thought, well, I I'm going to go get my master's degree and, um, do something different. So I did, um, I moved abroad and I got a master's degree in English in London, um, from King's college, but all the time I continued teaching, I was teaching online courses at the time. And uh, it really wasn't until uh, I had been teaching those courses for about two and a half years. Then I got a job teaching ESL for pre-K. And one day I just woke up and realized I love this. I absolutely love teaching. And I also realized the treasure of my own education, and particularly in many ways, the way in my own life and through my mother's home education, I had been able to experience classical education, but also Charlotte Mason education and not maybe as two opposed things, but for me as a unified whole, um, I felt this was a gift and that I, my life's calling was to bring it to other people. Um, so I looked for charter schools. Um, I, I remember sitting in my apartment in Russia and doing this. Um, that's where I was teaching ESL. Um, looking for classical charter schools that were working with low income districts and things like that. And I found a, a, a school in Dallas, Texas. Um, so I was with that organization for um, uh, about six years and uh, with a little break in there. Um, and I worked for their virtual school for a while. I worked for their charter school. Um, I helped with some uh, professional development. And all along the way, I was really um, impassioned to bring what I felt was the spirit of classical education. Um, because I think it, it brings life. Um, I think it um, helps us with some of these difficult questions. Um, classical education feels so wonderful when you talk about the theory, but when the rubber meets the road and you have children who struggle and things like that, to me, um, the spirit of classical education is what helps us to really understand um, how to make those wise choices in the classroom. So that's really my passion. Um, most recently before, um, uh, working as a consultant for uh, Beautiful Teaching. Um, I was a headmaster of um, a classical charter school in Little Rock, Arkansas. And due to family circumstances, I needed to step down from that. I have two children, um, a three-year-old and a 10-month-old. Um, and uh, my husband and I did need to make a move. We moved from the south all the way up to the northeast. We live in Massachusetts now. And um, 
but I'm still trying to find ways to share my love of classical education, share my love of Charlotte Mason, um, and to support anyone who is doing that work. So uh, I'm involved in a homeschool co-op and I'm going to be working with them on some of their pre-K and kindergarten things next year, um, which is perfect fit for my own children. Um, so that that's kind of uh, my, my story um, and uh, my real passion for what I think is the heart of classical education. Well, Kieran, and we are very fortunate to have you a part of the team, and I know you bring a lot of value to uh, us as your colleagues, and you will continue to bring a lot of value to our audience and the people that we are seeking to serve uh, in both our listeners and the schools that we partner with to do professional development or the people who join our courses. And I, and I want to explore all of that a little bit more with you. Um, it sounds like in some ways you came of age or, or grew up alongside this renewal in classical education, at least uh, in the way it's sort of being renewed stateside. And, you know, you and I are about the same age, and, and I was homeschooled too, so so you and I uh, will have to swap homeschool stories uh, at some point. But when we, when we talk to homeschool moms, you know, uh, who are our mother's age, you know, they had they had some resources, but they were still sort of just coming out of when homeschooling was, well, illegal in a lot of places. And it was still a bit of a Wild West sort of approach, right? It was kind of strange to say, yeah, I'm homeschooling my kids. That just really, really um, was not very, uh, not very common, uh, at least, you know, depending on where you were growing up. And so, you know, my mother sort of cobbled some stuff together and and she did her best with what she had. Anymore, there are just so many great resources. And on the one hand, that means that there's a lot out there for homeschool moms to, to tap into. And on the other hand, it seems to me that it could be very overwhelming to think, yeah. okay, well, there's all of this stuff now. You know, what should I what should I choose? What direction should I go? And part of that conversation is this question of the difference between, or or maybe we should start with what is classical education. And then, okay, now I'm hearing this thing about this neoclassical education, which it sounds like that's kind of what a lot of people were originally presented with when they were introduced to classical education. I wonder, do you have any sense, and if, if you can't pinpoint this uh, exactly, I, I understand, because I couldn't find the, the source either, but do you have any idea of when the, the term neoclassical started to be applied to um well, to something different than than classical education. I know that there's the the term that comes from the, the world of art and architecture. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when it's applied to education, do you have any sense of when that word started to be used? You know, sorry, I don't, I, I would not be able to pinpoint a source. I do not, I never heard that term in classical circles, which again, I kind of came of age in um, until the last maybe 10 years. So it is more recent. And I think a lot of this has to do with um, Really, when we talk about K-8 education, that is where the classical movement, um, I think we're really still almost in a tennis court of ideas and banding ideas around. Um, because uh, w when I was coming of age in the classical movement, uh, Dorothy Sayers and the Lost Tools of Learning was really used as a touchstone. And now there are a lot of other models, particularly for those elementary years, is 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 touchstone the right word, or, or should we just go ahead and say uh, holy grail or the? Or the... <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I, uh, famously, Dorothy Sayers presents this idea of grammar, logic, and rhetoric being stages of development, which are not that they're not presented as stages of development at any time prior in classical education. And Sayers says this herself that. Um, She's suggesting it as an idea. Um, Sayers was not a working educator, so she's just kind of suggesting that maybe that would be the case. So some schools have applied this really rigorously, um, and uh, that would uh, that model would suggest okay, grammar stages, just the facts, a lot of memorization. There's going to be a lot of emphasis on that, and not necessarily on um, what maybe Charlotte Mason educators and some other type of educators will emphasize. Uh, you'll hear the phrases living books, living ideas, that kind of thing. So those approaches don't necessarily have to be um, opposed, but I do think I've heard the term neoclassical more recently as these multiple models have emerged. 
Okay. So the way I understand the term is uh, essentially sort of in reflecting back on the development of thought surrounding classical education and its renewal, we can draw some some distinctions or point out some some things where uh, perhaps in that uh, I love that analogy of you know hitting the ball back and cross back across the net back and forth. Sometimes there's been a foul here or it's or it's been missed a swing and a miss, and and we can look back now at you know after you know 30, 40 years of of experience and say okay well here's how the the conversation um, has has progressed um, and I'm using that term. Uh, in in the positive sense, because we are looking to um, resource ourselves. And I I think it would be fair to say, and this comes from conversations I've had with Karen Glass and with Jason Barney, and of course with Adrian, who who I'm sure will want to chime in here in a minute. Uh, You know, we're not necessarily looking to go back to the past and find something that we can bring in and sort of just implement in the present, um, just sort of in this... um, primitive sort of uh, right. bringing, bringing something and thinking that it, we could just sort of shoehorn it into our contemporary moment. Rather, we're looking for something that goes back to a phrase you used that is in the spirit of classical tradition. Um, and and, and to, to be a true tradition is something that we're receiving, but also mm-hmm. receiving in our moment for our time. So um, classical education in our time, so to speak, which is right. different than perhaps what what the neoclassical movement sought to do. Um, let's talk about why you think the, 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 the Dorothy Sayers model, why did it catch on and, and why is it so, why does it have such a cult following, let's say? It's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there's something good there that people are, are looking for. What do you think that is? It's interesting, uh, Trey. I think you know my, my answer to that question would have evolved over the years. Um, so, When I first began teaching in a public charter school, I was coming from a very different background from most of the teachers who are coming more from uh, just a traditional public school setting. And um, I do not say that with any disparaging of their experience. I have learned so much from my veteran, particularly elementary school colleagues. You know, if you have been teaching elementary school in a public school for 30 years, I have learned so much from you and I'm so grateful. Um, one thing that I did learn though, is how much our current educational system relies on systematizing things. A lot of this is just due to, um, classroom management needs, particularly in, in low income public schools are just very intense. My, my husband works in a low income public school here in Massachusetts and, and he sees that managing the classroom is the number one thought on teachers' minds all day and every day. And so there's a need to systematize everything, to boil it down to the bare bones, to what um, what can be reproducible, um, because we just need to get everybody through the system. And, and every teacher feels that pressure. So I have had many teachers say to me, I would love to sit and read Beatrix Potter with my students, but I have to get them to achieve certain benchmarks. Um, uh, I have that pressure from the state. I have that pressure from society. And and many teachers are also pointing out, if I don't, if I don't teach them their alphabet, when are they going to learn it? Because we we have many children who come from home situations where the parents just simply aren't able to provide that in the same way. And so the teacher needs to keep their attention just on learning those letters. So, uh, and I say all of that to say, it's a complicated thing. It's, um, progressive educational ideology also plays into this. Um, But also just simply the demands of the classroom in the modern day. And so I think that in a lot of the neoclassical movement, and and I I often just think of this term neoclassical as being appropriate because it is true that Dorothy Sayers, most neoclassical schools follow a Dorothy Sayers model and it was new or neo. She was proposing something totally new. Schools had never been arranged so that children just memorized and then they just um, worked on arguments and logic and then they worked on rhetoric. Um, That's not to say that young children didn't do more memory work, maybe than older children, but the the strict categorization can't see that in the history of classical education. But I think that this model is very tempting in the modern day world, Um, A, where we do feel this, our children come out of school without knowledge. And uh, the 
the neoclassical model quite rightly identifies that let's get knowledge in them. Let's have them memorize facts and have knowledge. This is, this is a good thing, but we need to recognize that it's something that progressive public school educators, most of them will agree with us, that we need to get knowledge in them. Um, and I, I think the neoclassical movement was also feeling this um, just need that we have in our society today to systematize. And again, I, I grew up with this um, Charlotte Mason model, and one of Charlotte Mason's key tenets is the child is a person. And so the this is not to say that we, um, sometimes this can sound extremely progressive, uh, as though we listen to everything that the child says, well, it, you know, they're not interested in studying biology, so they don't have to, or something like this. It's not how Charlotte Mason means it, but rather she says that we need to think about education as feeding all parts of the person. So Charlotte Mason education is going to have you memorize things, absolutely, um, but she's going to place a greater emphasis on memorizing um, a full work of literature, a whole poem, things like that, as opposed to segmented facts. And there's gonna be overall just more of that emphasis on whole works of literature, whole texts, putting children in contact with that because we assume that children are people and therefore they're as interested in ideas as we are. Mm. Um, and, and I do think, I have had very unruly classes and it can become so easy to forget that children are people because, they have behaved uh, a bit more like animals every day in my classroom. And on those days, I was just talking to a teacher the other day, and she said, sometimes I sound like a drill sergeant. She said, but I just feel so desperate to get people to listen and learn something so that I don't get penalized. So someone doesn't come into my classroom and say, see, um, they're not learning to read, and it's because you're not covering the material. And I, I in there, I have so much sympathy for that. But I think that... The goal of classical education, what I experienced in my education, was this education that honors you as a person that feeds your soul and your mind and your heart. All of you is fed. And so it forms this richness that not just um, helps you to be a productive citizen or helps you to get a good career, but also when life is hard. Um, when there are deaths in the family and struggles, you can go back to the well of that education. It's made you a better person deep, deep, deep down. And I think we all want that, but we feel pressed for time. We feel like we have to worry about the career or the, the, the sort of uh, benchmarks that are set up for us. And so that's where that temptation to systematize everything comes in. Hmm. Kiernan, I'm so glad you started by affirming all of the good things that teachers who have worked in education, and I'm thinking of public education in particular, all the good things that they have done um, for children and for, for education as a whole. I mean, we're talking about people who have extremely difficult jobs and are faced with challenges um, on a number of different fronts. Not only, you know, the child in front of them, and usually it's about 20 of them, right? But also managing and, and and developing parent relationships, working with administrators who have various expectations, working within the state, um, and then within the federal government who increasingly wants to get involved uh, in, in, the, in the, the life of the classroom. And so the teacher, let's first and foremost just say that the teacher is going up against a lot of, yeah. of challenges. And I think at the heart of every good teacher is is a desire for good things, for the true, the good, and the beautiful. I think we use those words a lot. And yeah. I think any good public school teacher, I was saying this just the other day to someone, you know, I don't know of any teacher who would just come out and say, no, I don't want true, good, and beautiful uh, to be, uh, you know, the sort of the operative themes of my classroom. But the question is, is, okay, well, how do we actually um, live into that as teachers <laughs> and invite students into that life? And one of the things that the classical tradition um, gives us is it gives us a, a spirit and it gives us um, some patterns. Um, so it's not that it's void of methods or techniques. Those are there. But really, all of those are meant to be applied within particular contexts. And so we can, we can learn from Charlotte Mason because she, um, and if people are interested in where she fits into this conversation the episode we had with Jason Barney, um, he does a beautiful job placing 
Miss Mason within the classical tradition. And I would want to suggest that she is a perfect example of someone who is working in the classical tradition as a Christian. So mm -hmm. she's fully informed by her Anglican faith, which yeah. gives her a particular anthropology and a particular um, way of viewing human nature and and who this person is in front of her that is the student. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, she's able to take the wisdom from the classical tradition and and allow it to be shaped by her her Christian um, beliefs and and Christian practices again that have been handed down to her from the church, mm -hmm. and so um, I think when um, when we take a critical view of neoclassical, <laughs> really, uh, and and you can you can say more about this. Uh, I hope what we're trying to do is say, look, there's been a lot of good work done, right? Let's continue to examine and rethink the foundations of what we're doing here, going back to the sources and making sure that whatever we're doing moving forward is being informed by the spirit of, of the tradition and that we're shedding as much baggage as possible that has sort of, uh, you know, accumulated as a result of the influence of progressive mm -hmm. thinking. And, and if anyone's interested in this, um, I had a great conversation with Margarita Mooney where she pinpoints a lot of the, uh, just the way we think about education really stems from the influence of, of John Dewey. And it's kind of amazing how much came from one philosopher, but that's the power of philosophy. So Adrian, I wonder if you could, if you could jump in here and, and, and kind of contribute some of your thoughts to the conversation. Sorry, guys. Thanks. This was great. I've been listening a lot here and I, Thinking about uh, our audience, I think there's a few things I've heard that I that perhaps some of our listeners might be asking. So one question I think they could be asking is, what is the spirit of classical education? Mm -hmm. The other question is, so this sounds great. What does it look like in the classroom? Right. What's the difference? I mean, I, I get the rote memory work is one, but there's there's more differences. And I'd love to hear you expand on on both of those things. Um, well, I think first, you know, what is the spirit of classical education? I, I would be fearful to give anything but a working definition. Um, but I think I, in many ways, um, just even the intro to the classical education podcast captures it. Do you think classical education is about a conversation? Um, at the uh, school that I was part of the founding faculty in Texas, which is a low income charter school, um, as uh, students who had gone to the school every year from say third or fourth grade, got older, they would ask us more and more questions about classical education. So they would often say, why do we have to read so many old books? Um, why do we have to learn so many hard things? They were taking logic and Latin. And we would always explain to them that classical education is about being initiated into a great conversation. And so we would say, I want you to imagine a table. And there are a lot of wonderful philosophers, writers, thinkers at this table. They're dead, but you can still meet them because they have written their words. Um, they've captured their insight into the world, maybe also in, in works of art or music. And you get to participate in the conversation, but like any polite human being, you're going to listen first. You're going to figure out what the conversation is about. You don't have to agree, but if you disagree, you're going to make sure you understand first, and you're going to disagree after having thoroughly understood the voices of all the people at the table. And we would tell them, that's such a huge tradition that 12 years isn't enough for you to do it, but we can give you at least a start. So that's part of it. But I think part of that too, um, you want to engage in a conversation if you are being humanized. I think conversation is this essence of our humanity. It's why this is so exciting. Trey and I were talking about this before um, we started the podcast, that we just we love these enriching conversations. It is what great art and literature is born out of. And we have conversations because we're human. And I think that so often in education, and I have been guilty of this, but we lose sight of the goal. Mm -hmm. um, we all want good human beings to come out of our education. It's not to say we don't want successful human beings or intelligent human beings, but I think all of us as educators feel let down if our students are not just these deeply good people. And um, often you can sit and talk about what good is, and yet on the other hand, we all know goodness when we see it. And so I, I think that 
those are working definitions that get us to the spirit of classical education, that it's about a great conversation, that it's about um, helping our students embrace the fullness of their humanity. They are people, they are human beings. But helping them live into that is so much what their education is about. And that's going to include skills. Um, you can't read great works of literature if you can't read. And we all know that reading great works of literature makes you a better speaker. So all of these skills are part of it too. Um, that's not to say that skills or knowledge of these things don't matter, but we're looking to something even bigger and even higher. Um, and so often I, I would say to my colleagues, I know it's hard, um, particularly if you're, you're coming from all of these pressures of a public school, but let's try to pause and say, if we really could do that, if we could help our children understand what a gift it is to be a human being and to be able to be in relationship and to pursue truth, goodness, and beauty with other people, if we could do that, what would that look like? Um, I've never met an educator who didn't want to have that conversation. And I think that's exciting. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think um, one thing that comes to mind when you're saying all of this is that that is what good teachers do no matter where they teach. Exactly. And so like, I know your husband is teaching at a public school and he's teaching classically mm -hmm. <laughs> because good teachers who actually get it in terms of this is not just about preparing kids for a test and saying to them, oh, you don't need to know that because it's on the test. Good mm -hmm. teachers don't do that. Good teachers dive into the text in yeah. order to engage into a grand conversation with their students to help them actually, like you said, become more human. It's all about relational connections here. Mm -hmm. The skills happen along the way. Whereas mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes, it, and I, honestly, Kiernan, I would go so far as to say that the reason we're losing a lot of good teachers and a lot of teachers have quit, you know, there's been a mass exit in the schools is because they are good teachers and they're being pressured yeah. to focus on the skills and not on the relationship aspect of what it is to be a human being. So yeah. I, I want to encourage a lot of teachers who might be listening that are like, I just got a job at a classical school. I don't know how this is different than what I'm already doing. And I've worked with a lot of these teachers and I, and I often try to encourage them and say, if you care about your students and you have conversations with your yeah. students, you're already in the spirit of classical education. There yeah. may be some pedagogical things that you need to tweak. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Karen, and you and I have had a lot of conversations about mm -hmm. especially the problems in K-8. You already brought that yeah. up a little bit in the trivium mm -hmm. with the neoclassical, that the neoclassical K-8 movement does look different than what mm -hmm. we see in the tradition with a more of a Charlotte Mason, you know, bend. Uh, can you expand on that a little? I think that, well, I mean, I, I'd like to just start with the problem in some ways of K education that when we look back in the, the classical tradition, first of all, we're not necessarily looking at a tradition that tried to educate everyone. And that's something that we, we can acknowledge. They weren't necessarily looking at literacy for all. And so that's an additional thing we're trying to do. Uh, I don't think that means, oh, we can't do it classically, but we can recognize that that makes it hard as we delve into the tradition. We're going to have to dialogue with it. Um, I think that for K-8 education, um, often children weren't going to school until later. There was less time. There are all these pressures that um, are different now. And so I, I think that um, the neoclassical movement in many, many ways moved us back through kind of the lens of Dorothy Sayers to an earlier era of what was actually really progressive education in the public schools, which uh, was this kind of just the facts, ma'am. Um, uh, sometimes we hear the very negative phrase, drill and kill. And I will say, um, it is infinitely better if, if your class, um, if the way they study Egypt is they memorize all the pharaohs. I think there are more things you can do for that, but I am really glad that your children are coming out with actual knowledge, as opposed to maybe some soft feelings about Egypt or a, a poorly done documentary. That's infinitely better. So we, we want to acknowledge that, that knowledge is a good. But, and I think many people who worked in the neoclassical movement have struggled with this, it's just extremely difficult to keep up children's motivation, which is, it, this is what modern educators experienced with the sort of, again, drill and kill, which is a negative phrase, but it gives us kind of a sense of how it was perceived model that 
it just left a lot of students behind. Um, students with learning disabilities often really struggled with this model. And, and, and that is, um, uh, you know, where we can look back and uh, I always think of my, my grandparents um, went to public school in rural West Virginia. Um, and I mean, they taught Latin in their public schools. There were a lot of good things. On the other hand, um, uh, my grandfather struggled to learn to read and was essentially told that, well, I guess you can't read. Um, and so those are, are some things that we struggle with with that neoclassical model. When we go even further back, though, we can see that initially K-8 education is focusing a lot on this very holistic education in words and things. Lots of time in nature, so children aren't maybe in school for as many hours. Um, lots of literature, poems, songs, stories, things that as we get to the industrial revolution begin to fade away. Um, cultural systems that we have where people, and everyone knows this folk song and children learn it at their grandfather's knee. Well, that, that doesn't necessarily happen anymore. Um, particularly once we get to the industrial revolution, we have mass movements of people and things like that. So it's important to recognize that context um, that in K-8 education, we're trying simultaneously to go back and go forward. And um, Charlotte Mason, I think, is so important, particularly in this realm, because she is also trying to do that. She sees the pressures of the Industrial Revolution, and she says, we can move forward while also going back. Um, and, and in that way, I think her work really echoes G.K. Chesterton's phrase, like, the democracy of the dead, that... Um, Charlotte Mason doesn't say we have to do everything the way they did it, did it in ancient Greece. Um, I certainly would not want to live in an ancient Greek world as a wife. I would not want to have the rights of an ancient Greek woman. I am very glad to live when I uh, live now. But I can also acknowledge that the ancient Greeks had certain ideas about raising children that may be very beneficial to me, that maybe I need to bring into my day-to-day -day work in a school. So I, I don't say that to say Charlotte Mason has all of the answers, but I think for us in the modern world, she's so important because she gives you a jump start. Um, and that has always been true for me in my classroom, that even when I have not self-consciously thought, oh, I'm gonna do the Charlotte Mason method, often I find myself falling into her method because it works, because it's what gets me to that goal of helping my children become human, um, helping my students embrace the fullness of their humanity. It gets me to that goal in a practical and efficient way. Um, and, and I think that's the other piece of it. Charlotte Mason's background is as a working teacher. Um, she's not a philosopher. She's not a, which is not to say that she doesn't engage in philosophy on some level, but she's very upfront that her experience is teaching children. And she has a sense of what children can and can't do, what will work with them and what won't. She, she makes these very realistic practical comments about children's behavior in the classroom. And so um, I think that she is a fantastic place to start for those methods, hmm. which is why in so much of my training, I focus on some of these Charlotte Mason methods like narration, um, dictation, and copy work. Um, these arts that really get us back to that original trivia. Right. That's right. I, I know we both want to say, I want to say one thing and then Trey, you can go. Um, <laughs> What I love also about Charlotte Mason is she went back to the tradition she and did. pulled a lot of the methods. So a lot of these methods, the copy work, the dictation, the oral reading, all of this, it is from, it's what they did in the ancient schools. Quintilian did narration and said it was the most important um, art that the Romans stopped doing that was from the Greeks. He yes. actually said that. And then she perfected it with children. Okay, Trey, go. Well, we've been using certain words that I think are really important to highlight, human being and person. And as a way of getting at a definition of the spirit of classical education, I'd like to suggest that what we're aiming to do is focus in on the reality of the human person who is in front of us mm -hmm. and not in any way reduce them to something else. And there are a lot of things that we share with animals. Um, Aristotle talks about this. There are, and there are some ways that you can use similar approaches with training an animal as you can with a child. But a child is not merely an animal. A child mm -hmm. is, has a soul and is a person and is made for something much higher than, yeah. than any animal is. And so what can happen is we can we can develop certain pedagogies that 
work in certain ways. So they have this utilitarian quality to them. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're good. Just because something works doesn't mean that it's good. And this is part and parcel of the progressive ideology because they're so sort of, uh, you know, locked up in um, this um, pragmatism, right? Uh, so, so all these all these ideas are sort of again coming coming uh, around the same period of time when we're also thinking about um, Darwinism and sort of. Uh, the the evolution and development of 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 uh, of our species, and what what we forget, especially I'm, I'm speaking to Christian educators now, is that a lot of um, what happens in the school, that you might think, well, if we can just bring these things that, that seem to work or seem to be effective, and sort of put that together with the gospel, somehow that will be Christian education. Um, but what we want to suggest is actually classical education is more um, in line with the gospel because the church actually baptized the ancients, right? They mm -hmm. took Aristotle and Aquinas baptized them, but we can't forget that he needed to be baptized in the first place. So speaking to Christian educators, the, the great thing about the classical Christian approach is that we are constantly going back to those older sources and and thinking again about the human beings we have in front of us who and honoring their personhood and knowing not and knowing that we just don't need to reduce education down to something that that just happens to work or has or is effective in the moment uh we're we're at a much bigger uh on a much bigger project here it seems yeah. oh, something that came to mind Kiernan and Trey is just so our listeners can hear a practical, okay, I hear, I hear, I hear this, but okay, we do narration mm -hmm. and, we, and we are following more of an, uh, a neoclassical model. So, or they could be thinking, oh, great. I must be traditional classical because our kids are narrating, right? So mm -hmm. you and I have also had this conversation. How is narration different in a neoclassical model versus the tradition of classical that Charlotte Mason is doing. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. So I grew up narrating, and um, I I I didn't even think about it um, as a child. And I think I would have by the time I was eleven or twelve, um, I would have thought of it as my mother and I had a conversation about it. Of course, that conversation would usually start with me telling what I had read. But I mean, it was really our interaction, the bouncing back and forth of ideas based in this text, having the book open in front of us. I remember reading the Euthyphro, Plato's Euthyphro, when I was in sixth grade. My mother and I read it aloud together. Then we'd close it, we would narrate it, we would discuss it. It, it, I, it obviously, it was a profound experience because I, I still can kind of put myself um, in my chair with the book in my hand um, to this day. So I remember it well. But, um, when I started teaching at Charlotte Mason School, sometimes narration felt very different to me. So I would read a passage with a group of students and then we would close the book and ideally narration is done with the, the book. Um, students aren't referring back to the book. And so I'd ask them to narrate. Well, very quickly, this began to feel like this performative exercise in memorization. Um, I found students were massively stressed about narration, and I understood why I also was stressed. I will never forget having someone do a guest um, uh, teaching model in my classroom with my students, and he called on this student who particularly struggled to narrate. And I just sat there with my, my nails clenching into my chair, in my mind, praying that she would remember enough details for him to judge it a good narration and her a good narrator. And for me, I really struggled with this because that was not my personal experience of narration. My personal experience of narration was of this slow, gentle, and yet rigorous um, training in the habit of attention that I slowly but surely learned to pay better and better attention to the details so that I could keep them in my mind so that I could have a fantastic conversation. So I actually remembered what was in the book and I could talk about it with someone. Um, and so I, I think some of that, I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, but to me, this um, is yet again, uh, I think when we narrate in this model that narration is um, 
about how many facts you remember from the texts. Um, when that becomes our goal, all of a sudden, thinking we want our children to become more human, we want them to be able to participate in the great conversation, we've lost that goal. And now we're thinking facts. How many facts do they know? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm hearing two key ideas here. System versus conversation. Yes. Right? Okay, so neoclassical would be more focused on a systematic attainments. And one thing that I have had a conversation with recently at, at the school I work at is one of the struggles these, these teachers do narration and, and I'm being called upon to train them in narration and help them to get, you know, better and better at it. Cause it's, it's a skill that you just always want to practice and get better at. Mm -hmm. And one of the key ideas that we've identified is the key problem, which I need to know what is the key problem so I can train them well. Right. Yeah. The key problem in, in, in this, a lot of the schools I've worked with and in the school I'm going to be working at is that teachers tend to begin to see narration as an assessment tool mm -hmm. instead of an art. Yeah. So I'm developing a whole session on narration as an art versus mm -hmm. an assessment tool. And as an art, it should lend itself to this beautiful conversation, like you're saying. Yeah. That's not to say that there aren't goals within it. There are mm -hmm. skill goals that I think the teachers should know. Okay, narration is going to help them learn all these wonderful skills. It's going to help them organize. It's going to help them analyze. It's going to help them synthesize. All of these things are going to happen, but we, it's, it's not, the goal isn't to have this checklist of things that are going to happen within narration. Mm -hmm. The goal is to have a beautiful experience and a conversation. And like you said, I love how you said it, Kiernan, is that you wanted to remember more and more from the text so that you could actually enter into an intelligent conversation with your mother. And yeah. I, I think that, that that hits it home really well. So I hope this helps people understand pedagogically the difference between perhaps the neoclassical um, ideas and, and mm -hmm. methods versus the classical tradition. And this also goes back to worksheets and comprehension questions yep. and how you ask the questions and are mm -hmm. the questions there just to have a comprehensive test or mm -hmm. are the questions there to help have a beautiful conversation to engage with the relationship mm -hmm. of the living book. So we've talked about the word relationship a lot too. And, and I think, I think we can rightly put that, next to the idea of, of a systematic approach. That's not to say that there's no place for, to think in terms of larger systems um, and human beings work inside of systems and we create yeah. systems, um, right. but we're not, we're not primarily made for systems. We're primarily made for relationships. And when you're dealing with uh, a child, especially someone who um, is, is being formed uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very, in a very particular way that you only receive in childhood, and then you sort of, you 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 live that out uh, throughout the course of your life. So there's there's a moment there that um, that needs something uh, really really special, and and it is it is the relationship primarily, and that's why Charlotte Mason was keen to remind people of of the importance of the the relationship between the teacher and student the student and, and the subject, the student and the text, all these are, are at the heart of good education. And that's because that's what we're made for. We're made for relationships. Mm -hmm. I think, um, it, just thinking about this question of method, a, a way that I have often thought about it in my own classroom is that um, as a teacher, I always need to be reminded of my goal. Um, that my goal is not necessarily they're all going to get great jobs, um, though I do want them to be able to get into any college they would want. I don't want to exclude that, but I'm seeking even higher. Um, I don't just want them to have superficial virtue. I want them to be good people. So I'm trying to cultivate them as people. So I need to always be reminded, you know, in the summertime, okay, set my sights high. Um, uh, that, uh, yes, we, we, we do want college and career, but we want more than that. Um, and I, I also then, um, we need a rigorous curriculum. This is a beautiful thing. I think that classical education has revived this sense that we don't say Shakespeare is too hard, but we um, work on bringing our students to it. 
And so uh, the challenge for me was always, how do I take this work of literature and find a way to raise my students up to the level of this work of literature? I was an English teacher. And that's where then knowing um, some of the methods that have been used in the tradition, I, I think of them as um, uh, a sort of different skills that I have as a teacher. It's as though um, I'm an artist, and so there are different types of brush strokes I can use. And I have to make the decision uh, what brush, brush stroke to use when. And if you've ever done art, you know, it's not as simple as always use this one or always use that one. No one could make like a mathematical list of one step two, step three in order to get the perfect painting of this sunset, because that's not exactly how it's going to work. On the other hand, there is such a thing as as right and wrong in in painting. Right? We can say on some level, well, that didn't work out. You were trying to make it look like this and it, it failed, right? So I've always found this analogy to be very helpful because I often tell teachers, I can't tell you exactly how to do it, but I can tell you um, maybe some boundaries that work and I can show you this is how I do it. And then you're, you're going to do your own work of art and that, that should be this beautiful relationship for you and the students. Um, so a, a good example is I, I've taught the poem Mending Wall by Robert Frost um, to multiple eighth grade classes. Um, and some of those classes have been very advanced classes. Um, and some of those classes have been classes that were less advanced. I taught it every time. I didn't change the curriculum. I always taught this poem because I think it is just a, a fantastic and incisive poem for middle schoolers. It asks some questions that they are asking. But then each time I was sitting down with it, uh, the way in which I bridged my students to the text and I built that bridge between them and the text so that they could actually in some sense meet Robert Frost and ask the questions he's asking with him was different. Um, how much vocabulary do I define? I, if you've ever been in a classroom, you know that to give them 100 vocabulary words is extremely discouraging and they're shut down immediately. Um, uh, but on the other hand, if they don't know any of the words, they're not going to understand it. Um, how much, uh, uh, how often do we pause and narrate? Narration tells me how much they're understanding. Um, is this class a, a class that needs to go a little bit slower? We pause every two to three lines. We restate what they say. Do they need to do more? Um, maybe partner narration with each other, coming to the whole group, more written narration. So, so this is where I think classical education to me is, is so exciting because it is an art and it is you as a particular teacher, as a particular human being with your loves and your strengths and your weaknesses. And then, then you learn the skills of classical teaching, but when you do them, they will be different, just as a, a, a Rubens is not a Rembrandt, and so your classroom will not be my classroom. And then you begin to use those with your particular students, and it, that's going to incarnate in a particular relational way. And I can't give you a, a, a perfect list. And this is not to say that curriculum is not useful. I've written curriculum. So curriculum can be an absolute uh, necessity, uh, especially for a, a new subject that you're teaching, it, it can help you learn a lot of these methods. But at its core, classical teaching is not something that we could ever just simply reduce to this curriculum has it all. And I recognize that that's a controversial thing to say, but I, I think if you have ever experienced the beauty of thinking with your students, with students who um, do not have as much life experience as you, who may have a lot of differing strengths and weaknesses. But I, 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 last year, I will never forget, I had a class um, and we, we did a round table seminar discussion of Robert Frost's Mending Wall. And at the end of it, they exited the classroom and I just cried because I thought, you know, that moment will never come again and I will never see that poem the same way. I had new eyes on this literature and on my own life. I saw my own life in a different way because, of course, this is a poem that's talking about tradition and our dialogue with tradition and how, how do we keep tradition without, without letting it become old and dead. And my students had engaged with that in ways that challenged me. And I thought, this, this is it. This is education. We're all better people walking out of here. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't write that lesson plan perfectly. Um, I can write the lesson plan and that's about 50% of it. And then I can do the lesson and that's, that's the magical part. And then we could talk about what made that magic. And, and, and that's what's exciting. I think about teaching. Wow. Yeah. I think that was beautifully said. I mean, really, you know, the, the spirit I think is, you know, will, will find its way uh, into the, 
uh, just just deep into the bones of, of of many a good teacher. Now, the challenge, of course, as you well know, is let's say that you know somebody's fired up about this and they're seeing all these connections because because again they're they're seeing through through the spirit of classic education and they're they're re-examining the their their approach and 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 viewing their students in this very humane way and and they're starting to rethink certain practices in the classroom um knowing that they don't need to just sort of sort of enter into this sort of very you know free for all like well there's no you know there's no real handrail here at all i can just as long as we're having a good time i mean that's not what we're saying because there are the the, the great thing about the tradition is there are revealed truths that we didn't come to through our own reason we couldn't know them. God had to reveal them to us. And I know I'm preaching at this point, but just bear with me. And so the, the classical Christian teacher in particular has, has been empowered by their administration to, to make those truths clear. And then what you do sort of in the presence of those truths um, will in different ways invite students into a deeper communion with that truth. And so, as you say, that's going to look different ways uh, in different classrooms with different children and different teachers. Um, but I'm wondering, sometimes schools are very clear about the parameters and they say, well, guess what, teacher? We need a lesson plan submitted on this time at this day and it better have these things in it. And I'm going to come by and I'm going to I'm going to sit in your classroom and make sure you check those boxes. And I'll tell you what, that's a spirit killer for me. I don't know for you, <laughs> but I know a lot of teachers are working within those Can constraints. I have sent out those emails. I, I've demanded those lesson plans. Pure well, well mea culpa, mea culpa. <laughs> Help us out here. What do you do when you're in that situation, but you're on fire in the spirit, let's say? I, you know, I think this is such a tension. So to me, a, a guiding phrase, to return to Robert Frost, because I, I don't know, I moved to New England, so he's on my mind. Um, and he's like my favorite poet. Um, Robert Frost once said that writing poetry without um, metrics was like playing tennis without a net. So without opening up the, the, the can of worms that is free verse poetry, which I am not saying free verse poetry is not poetry. However, I find this analogy useful for education. Um, if you want to play tennis, like there are some rules, there's a net. So I, I would often tell my teachers as an administrator, I, I haven't seen anybody yet completely wing it and have an amazing class. I've seen people wing it and have amazing moments in a class. Usually those people have so many years of preparation and experience behind them that they kind of have already planned. But I've never seen anybody not intentionally plan for a good lesson. However, um, I can't give you, I can give you some basic components of that. Some things that you really have to plan this in advance if you want the magic to happen, but the plan will not make the magic happen. And I think sometimes as administrators, we want to do that. We require like a wonder question. I mean, Lord, the wonder question usually appears in the middle of the conversation because a student, they wondered spontaneously and of their own accord, right? But I, I understand it. As an administrator, you're so desperate to have your school, your whole school have this beautiful and wonderful atmosphere that, that we all just, that, that's what we know. We live in the world of the, the big box chain franchise. And so it's just where our mind goes. We're like, you know, wonder TM. Um, we, we, that's what we want to do. And I understand that because I have done that. But I think the more we can dig into on the opposite side, this idea of conversation and relationship. So it, we could think of tennis as our analogy. We could think of relationships as our analogy. Relationships are not an anything goes sort of transaction. You can't do whatever you want in a relationship and hope to have successful relationships with people. On the other hand, scripts are not going to get you a spouse or good relationships with your um, siblings or with your parents or with your children. You, you can't script all that out. Um, and so I think the difficult part of being human beings, and I think for Christians, this should be a familiar tension to us, is that um, the law was our tutor to lead us to Christ, but the spirit gives life. Um, I, I think we have to live in this tension and we 
as teachers, we have to live in it. We have to plan, we have to be ready, not anything goes. That is where professional development is useful and methods are useful. You can't just do anything you want and say this is narration or this is copy work or this is classical. On the flip side, um, I don't think a five point stages of narration that you hold to every time, no matter the child, no matter the book, no matter the circumstance is ever going to get you those magical moments when the classroom comes alive and you think, this is a little taste of heaven. This is what heaven's going to be like, um, at, at least in a, in a Christian school. Though I've experienced this in secular contexts where you feel you've met soul to soul. Um, that's special. That's unique. And no, you can't box or package that. But you can, we can all try to encourage one another. That's why our relationships within the classical education movement matter. How we work together as colleagues, whether we're more um, philosophical and we're doing that philosophical work of classical education, and we're the kindergarten teacher and we are doing that heavy work of teaching phonics, that those collegial relationships, John Henry Newman talks about this, that the collegial relationships are what real classical education comes out of. This is awesome. I don't think we can top any of what you just said. It was so amazing, Kiernan. I, I'm thinking about our listeners and thinking, okay, y'all, you're constantly asking me when I was working at UD, emails from teachers, can you just send us videos of teachers teaching like this so we can see it? Because we've learned mimetically. So yeah. I would encourage our listeners to go to our beautiful teaching.coursestorm.com and sign up for your courses. Kiernan's going to be offering multiple courses all, all year round. Um, she's got one coming up on mimetic instruction. It's a two-hour class, I think. Very affordable for teachers. We, we were keeping the prices right where teachers could, could do it. And if you want to see how this works, immerse yourself in one of Kiernan's classes because you're actually going to be a student and experience this, mm -hmm. getting to watch her teach, getting to experience it. And she's made lots of time for Q&A. So I'm, I'm really wanting, I'm excited that you're, you're coming on to do this because we both know from our years of working with teachers that this is a huge need. Um, and Trey, would you mind closing out with our, our closing question? <laughs> I, I'd be happy to. Kiernan, thank you so much. And like I said at the start, uh, we are just really privileged to have you on the team. And uh, this conversation has helped me a lot, and, and I hope it has helped others as well. I'm wondering, can you think of uh, either a quote uh, that has been something that has um, just stuck with you over the years and has helped you think about the way you approach teaching or um, or maybe a book recommendation, something that you wish you had read earlier in your teaching career. You can you can share either one or both with us. Oh, Trey. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for this conversation, which has been so life-giving to me. I'm privileged to be able to work alongside you. Um, I think that the when you asked a quote that's kind of a um, I guess a touchstone for me as a teacher um, is probably Charlotte Mason's um, phrase, education is an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life. Um, when I feel my classroom has gone astray, I come back to that. I could say a, a lot more about it. Um, but I think um, w whenever, in whatever way I am educating, whether it's with my own children or um, w in a large classroom or a small one, just remembering those truths, um, it brings me back to the spirit of classical education every time. So That's wonderful. Well, Karen and Fiore, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>